Well, while we're waiting for people to come on in, Ken, do you want to tell us where you're located? Uh, sure. I'm in, uh, currently I'm in uh, Joshua Tree, California, uh, where I have a, a, a house slash studio slash Airbnb <laughs> that I rent out. <laughs> and uh, the part just opened. It had been closed because of COVID until, uh, until yesterday, day before yesterday. Welcome everyone to our first ever virtual Echo Locate event, um, where we'll take an in-depth look at select works by featured artist Ken Gonzalez Day. My name is Kara Megan Lewis, and I'm one of the directors at Bridge Projects. To give you a little background of the Echo Locate series, it began in 2016 under the direction of Christian Gonzalez Ho, who's a guest today in the audience, and Linnea Spranzi. It takes the format of a studio visit and layers on top of it a framework of guiding questions that allow attendees an opportunity to reflect and respond to an artist's practice in meaningful ways. Our second exhibition, To Bow and to Bend, which you see behind us, us it, it opened on the eve of the stay-at-home mandate, and it explores the spiritual, art historical, and ecological significance of trees through the work of 31 artists. Featured guest, California artist Ken Gonzalez Day is one of the participating artists and his photograph, Two Men Were Taken Behind Linnea, contributes a powerful example of a witness tree to the exhibition. Witness trees are trees that have been present at historical, often traumatic events. In Gonzalez Day's own words, he seeks through his research-based practice to make erasure into a site of production and absence into an effective presence that critically engages viewers and creates new meaning. Gonzalez Day, um, who received his MFA from the University of California, Irvine, and MA from Hunter College in, NYC, in New York City, is a professor of art at Scripps College. His work has been widely exhibited at major institutions, including LACMA and the LAX Art in Los Angeles, Tamayo Museum, Mexico City, Pelé de Tokyo in Paris, among others. And so without further ado, we'll get started and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Linnea Spranzi. Hello. Welcome everyone. So part of the format is that we're going to be doing a shared exercise and you can jot down your thoughts either on your computer, which is conveniently right in front of you, I assume, um, or the good old fashioned pencil and paper also works. Um, so the first exercise is a long view of the work that's behind me. We'll do a screen share. And we're going to spend about an, a minute, a minute and a half looking at it. And you can use your chat function to um, give us any responses that you feel moved to share. Um, if you just want to quietly meditate yourself on the image and, and not share anything, it's also your prerogative. Um, but this is going to be unprompted, simply absorbing the image. So we'll start that now. All right, for those of you who want to share in the chat function your thoughts or meditations on this piece, feel, feel free to and I will say them aloud. I feel that they look like twins who begin identically, then evolved into their own discrete beings. A eulogy. Two trees, two tracks, two rows of fence, and a spot of roof on the horizon. A gateway. It's odd that there are only two trees in such a vast space. I wonder if a single tree was somehow divided. The trees are like a gateway. The path goes through them. They are beautiful and lonely. Sentinels, gateway, threshold, passageway. I'm interested in the rise, the horizon, and that there are objects just beyond it. There is a sense of abandon. The photograph is witness to what cannot be seen. The photograph is witness to what cannot be seen. I feel a sense of trauma. The trees continue to be viewers of violence. Because the view is pitched uphill, the horizon feels too close, the perspective cut short. 
All right. So we're going to go to the next image. This image is one that's never been seen before. And Ken has decided to share it with us. This one is going to be accompanied by a prompt that I'm going to share with you. The prompt is this. Ken considers part of the value of his work to witness forgotten, unjust, and or violent histories. Why is this meaningful? Can a photograph act as a form of witness? What is the value of witness? We're going to spend about a minute, minute and a half looking at this image, and then we'll do the same thing where you share your thoughts based on that prompt or not, and I'll read them aloud. And we'll start that exercise now. All right, I'll begin reading. Witness resists erasure as well as forgetting. I feel an image and an event are one. Witness and silence often entwined with presence too. I think about trying to read the event in the appearance of the tree itself. I'm not sure if the sign on the tree is meant to be legible but its mute declaration seems fitting for the tree. The lighting, post, and rope makes it feel like a memorial. The lighting makes it seem theatrical. Sites of trauma as sites of tourism. The tree is a witness to the darkness before it. The tree stands in for the human body, the witness of all nature. I can't help but think of Grunewald and the missing figure of John the Baptist as witness. A photo is a form of hierography, bears witness to what is visible to the light and chemicals. This photo carries the majority of its meaning within the things that are no longer there, i.e. the negative spaces. Okay, thank you for participating in that. Now Ken and I are just going to um, spend some time talking and Ken is going to share um, his screen with us and some images he wants to share as well as some stories. Um, we'll discuss some of what you have responded with and then he will give us more insight, insight into his overall practice. So, Well, there's so many things I could say. Um, but I'm going to try to keep it short, and then I really do want to hear questions from people, right? So we're going to have a, a format for that. This one I just wanted to add that uh, you can see the credit at the bottom. It actually is a historical marker, uh, number 460, <clears throat> and it's basically near the entrance to Yosemite, which um, used to, I guess, have a gold, gold mining town or, you know, frontier town. And <clears throat> the tree... The, the the hanging tree was said to have had as between three and sixty uh, cases. I was able to identify one uh, Latino that was uh, one account of a Latino being hanged at it, which is why it was of particular interest to me. And you can see from looking at the photo that somebody has tried to capitalize on that history. I, I assume the, pl the the plaque is blank; it's just white uh, with a little bit of rust coming off of the nail. Uh, there may have been text at some point, but it's now gone. And you can see that there's some uh, metal bands around the trunk. So the tree has actually fallen apart and has been put back together. And according to my further research, it probably was not at that location. <laughs> the tree may have been across the street and they moved it at some point in the 50s. There is a cabin next to it, which you can rent, which is supposed to be Bret Hart's cabin. Bret Hart was a well-known California writer. And so it is certainly part of the tourist trade that goes to uh, Yosemite. And I love that somebody had made that point of the, the idea of, of trauma as tourism, because of course, there's a way in which sites do resonate for us and we want to witness it, them again, but then we're also in a, in a way become complicit or can become complicit in the perpetuation of that, uh, of that history. So it's all of those things together, right? We want to raise awareness, but then we also don't want to uh, misrepresent. And so, that is a delicate balance that we all, 
I think particularly those of us that make things visually uh, have to balance with. And so I like this one because on the one hand it is real and on the other hand it's fake, <clears throat> right? Somebody's moved the tree. In other words, the things that we expect when we think about what resonates as historical truth are mediated, just like language itself. So that they move the tree may or may not change the meaning of the tree, right? I guess it depends on what you're looking for in that tree and whether uh, the number of people was three or 60. Again, these are issues that uh, tell us a lot about the way that erasure happens, about the way that- There are 60 get... people oh, yeah. that were hung on it. Is that what you're saying? Three or 60 people. Yeah, so most accounts that can be more closely uh, identified are like three. So it's probably one to th three that would be like nameable. Um, and the 60 is probably folklore and retelling. When you don't have the, the historical information, we don't know for sure. But I think uh, most of the sources I, I, I looked at it said between three and 60. Um, and then this one I wanted to share just very quickly, um, it's uh, showing, uh, <clears throat> oh, so that's the quote for the previous slide. And then this image is from a, a, a lynching in San Jose of two white men in 1933. And after they killed them and stripped them and put the bodies uh, uh, to the tree, then they started taking the branches off and taking souvenirs, chopping bits and pieces of the tree to take with them. So when, we, again, we think about this idea of witnessing uh, they really wanted a piece of that tree. And in the end, the trees had to be cut down because people were uh, fetishizing the, the killing of these two men. And uh, you can see them here quite happily participating in that activity. The, the gray markings on it are because the image is, was originally used for a newspaper. And so the retouching would disappear in the black and white version. So I like it because it, of course, resonates with that, again, the question of the truth of uh, journalism. And then I just, yeah, go ahead, please. Could you um, step a little further back for those of us who aren't fully familiar with your practice and maybe narrate how you arrived at this particular project because Second Garot is one example in a whole stream of interests that are in this vein, but it's interesting to know the backstory behind these pieces. Of course. As an artist. Yeah, happy to share, and, and please, yeah, anything I need to clarify, just let me know. Um, so the project started because, of course, uh, in 2000, around 2000, um, George W. Bush created a policy that basically uh, transformed the passing of the border from Mexico to the U.S. into a crime, and so they could then arrest people for crossing the border. Prior to that, for the previous um, several millennia that people had lived on the continent, <laughs> it was not a crime to cross the border. <laughs> there were you know, various limitations to, to crossing it, but basically uh, this idea of Mexicans as, as evil, as people that should be hated, was uh, really being articulated very strongly by the Bush uh, presidency. And I wanted to try to create something that spoke to, to that history. And I found myself looking back to this older history that I didn't actually know about and kind of came across. And I was startled and dumbfounded to know that Latinos have been hated for such a long time in this area as a Latino, as a Mexican American who grew up here and having had it, those experiences where people would say, you know, rather dreadful things to me. I thought, I wanna make an art project that speaks to the current events, right at that point, these new immigration laws. But I also wanna create a project that speaks to the larger history that's not just my history, that's not just about Latinos, that's about these larger struggles uh, and about the, the breakdown, I guess, of, of justice. Um, so that's how the project started. And then uh, at some point in, in doing the research on those histories of uh, specific lynchings, um, I started then traveling to look for the sites. So the <laughs> exhibition yeah, includes trees, and so we included a tree from my journey to, uh, called uh, Searching for California Hang Trees. And part of what was surprising in your research was that these um, mob uh, events, these mob lynchings were, were pretty early on. Um, and they're kind of contrary to a lot of the stereotypical expectations of what that means. 
happening in California very early on in America's history and mostly for Latinos and Chinese and um, Native American. Americans, yeah. Well, so that was part of the surprise for you, I imagine, too? Yeah, so part of it is this is the history before the history you think you know. So when you think of racialized violence in America, you tend to think of black and white, mm -hmm. understandably, because the history of lynching in America is predominantly that. But if you look at the historical time clock, basically the California cases begin with the beginning of statehood, so 1850, which is uh, really before um, all the Jim Crow laws and stuff that happened after the Civil War. So what we see is actually the development of a, a racialized violence racialized group violence emerging in America. It had existed in even from the early uh, colonial days as a part of American independence, this idea of, of, of sort of taking the law in your own hands or communities, uh, you know, rep defending themselves. But it begins to take a, a racial turn, I would say, um, in the 1850s, 1840s, where we really see the language of racism being invoked around some of these cases. And then we see 1860, 1870, the Chinese immigration. Of course, it goes up 18, 1880, 1880, uh, we begin to see the, the lynching of African Americans as a way of sort of, you know, as we all know, of sort of uh, restricting their access to rights. And then 1900, the numbers of lynchings begin to increase. Suddenly now they're up to 100 a year and so on and so forth until the history that we know. So I, so the research that I was interested in was to try to locate Latino bodies within a history of racialized violence in America. That was my particular interest. And if we could see all of that linked together, then we might begin to have more empathy for the way that violence works and, and, and less about the individual bodies. So there's, you know, there's Italian Americans who are lynched when Italians are racialized. There's Jews, there's, um, there's Germans, there's, there's a, there's a Swiss guy. There's a range of different things. The, the, the idea is to think about justice rather than about race. And I think uh, to decouple those two things a bit and to try to, to reformulate for our own time how we will take this legacy here, for everybody that's here. Well, now you have this information. What do you do with it? How do you change the way that you, that you perpetuate right, race, racialized violence, history, and narrative? And the tree is the, in the exhibition, is, is also thinking about other aspects of, 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 of I guess, of, living, of being a living being. So um, what we're looking at here as well is this continuation of that project, but also what's interesting about what you just said in combination with what we look at is that you're collapsing that history, that, that past, with a, a photo that's taken now at the site, or if not of the specific tree, then of the landscape. And um, some of these landscapes are very bucolic and others are more brooding. And it's, it's very interesting because in and of themselves, sometimes the, the images are simply, they seem to be simply of a tree, but it reminds me of um, family histories or once you have a certain bit of knowledge, the image can totally transform. Um, and that's part of, what you're after is is the potency of memory, how it can transform an environment completely. It seems to me. Is that fair to say? I think so. I mean, there's a number of things happening, and some of them have to do with what we think we're looking at when we see a photograph. But uh, definitely, the question of um, of artistic agency, the notion of a gesture. So, if, so if imagine, for example in the real world that, that, that literally hundreds, if not thousands of Latinas have been killed in various ways over several centuries um, and continue to now to be imprisoned and all that stuff. So the invisibility of that, of that history. Uh, we all know of it in some level. We hear Trump, we think that's bad. It's not us, it's all somewhere else. But um, there's been no visual place to, to, to attach our, um, our understanding of that complexity. So if I show you a picture of a plantation tree, if we're gonna stick with trees, 
with all the moss and the plantation in the background, we, we will think of slavery. We will think of uh, the legacies that, that that connects with. But when we, we don't have an equivalent visual uh, language for the Latino experience in America. And I think in part, um, that is, these are the building blocks of, a, of, a, of an alphabet. If you imagine that, that one communicates, shares with others, if I could be you know, one being and share with another, uh, how do I share my experiences with another person who doesn't know where I'm coming from, right? And so I think from my perspective, art is the bridge. Art is the bridge that gives me a voice. Uh, art is the bridge that gives other people uh, an entry point to a conversation that we can have together, much like we're having here, even though it's we haven't yet gotten everybody else in, involved. But certainly we're, I wanna be sure to lay out the framework that this is an invitation to think not about my particular history or perspective, but to think about how, how we can, as a, as, as a group of individuals, as a generation of individuals, change the legacy we leave behind, change the, the story that we tell, uh, the people to tell about us going forward. And, and I think that's worth doing. Yeah, indeed. Do you wanna narrate this image we're looking at right now? Sure, so the, the project started, as I mentioned, looking at the history of lynching in California. And many people that know my work know this, they don't wanna hear a whole lot about it, but I will just say I discovered or uh, documented over 350 cases of lynching in the state of California and was able to verify that indeed Latinos, Native Americans, and Asians made up a large number of that, uh, of that list and African Americans as well. But it showed us that the majority, if we combined all those groups together, that two thirds were people of color. And if you've seen any of the Wild West movies, we tended to think as a country of the Wild West as being race neutral, that race was not a factor, that it was not really the, the motivation behind the majority of the Wild West movies. So the first part was to look at California's history, <clears throat> to think about the idea of the Wild West and to reconfigure uh, that. And then the second part was then to start looking for these. I just started wanting to drive to these sites and see where they were. Um, so a lot of it, is, it's called searching for California hang trees because I was just searching. I drove, I drove from the top, from the top of the state to the bottom of the state and burned out of more than a few gaskets on my car and, uh, and, and wanted to, pay, uh, to bear witness to these sites, be at these sites, look for these trees. A lot of them, uh, or some of them are, I don't know where the tree was. And some of them were more historic and had markers. So, you know, um, so the journey was about looking for the history and, and embodying the history. And that even if I, on some level, drop dead tomorrow, um, no one can undo what I've done, right? <clears throat> they can ignore it, but they can't undo it. Um, and so the other part was then, because if you see the trees, of course, you don't know anything about the Latino history or the other histories that I'm referencing. And so I also did this series where I photographed individuals from that community, basically three Latino men in this particular photo you see. And I, I shared with them the history because I didn't know that everybody would know it. And then I asked them to give me a response and then I took their portrait. So I said, I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna take your portrait. Give me, you know, what do you think when you hear this history kind of a thing. So it basically meant as an encounter and rather than photographing uh, dead Mexicans, I wanted to allow people to see um, people that really were about the same age and race as most of the victims. Most of the victims were very young, young men, uh, majority, not all. Um, and then here, just to show you two examples. So the Holcomb Valley tree is, uh, doesn't have a state marker, but it's recorded as in, uh, locally as a, a historic hang tree. And th there's again, stories that say that they cut a branch off each time they hung somebody that's probably not true since the bottom branch is only about four feet tall. But, you know, it's, it's wrapped in a bit of mythology around the West, but certainly it seems to have been a, a real tree. And then the other one of the Fort Humboldt uh, is, uh, is the fort where they, they uh, hanged uh, a number of Native Americans. And I don't know if that's the actual tree. It's a very old tree. It's one of the, old, the biggest tree in that park, as you can see. But when I stood there, if you could look at the bottom, it looks like there's a noose hanging from the, from yeah, the branch. Right. Yeah. And when I stood there and the, I felt like the tree spoke to me, I had to take the picture. You know what I mean? Like I'm walking around looking for these trees and this thing pops up. So I know it's definitely in that park. It's within a hundred yards of that park because it's not a giant park. 
uh, there were, you can see even from that shot, there aren't any other big trees there. This tree would have been a witness to that event, if not the actual tree. And so from my perspective, and in keeping with the title of the series, Searching for California Hang Trees, I felt that it, it, it did the, the job. It helped me to, to, to it, first of all, it spoke to me when I stood there. And secondly, uh, it was in the right location, in the right place, and had enough data to add to it. And future scholars can add more information. They could say, yeah, that wasn't it, but it was 50 feet away, or whatever they're going to do. But I've left a trail of breadcrumbs for people to add to, and I think that's part of what history is as well. Yeah. Sometimes I, you can say the act of witnessing is a communal act as well, that you know, many people should be involved in that. Well, and everybody here is now involved in that, right? Yeah, because exactly. everything at, at talks is once you've heard the talk, then how do you, what do you do with that information? How does it change you? And if it doesn't change you, <laughs> then then yeah. you know what are we doing here? Yeah. On some level. So should I show more? Should I stop? Should we get some questions? You keep going, Ken. We're gonna have a separate time of actual questions, um, okay. and it's coming soon. So. Okay, um, so I'll show a few more things quickly, I, and then. Yeah. Keep going. So then I, I, again, most people know, that know my work know the race lynching series, where I took historic images, postcards mostly, of uh, that depicted lynching in America and erased the body. These began in the, in the Southwest, because that was part of, tied to the book research I was doing. But uh, since then, has expanded to all parts of the country because of, of course the, the history is the national history and it seemed it had to expand. So this is just a, a schematic to show you. There's, uh, each set has 15. So basically I, I work on 50, 50, up to 15, make a grid and then move to the next set. Part of why it takes so long, this has been over, tw well, over 20 years I've been collecting these. Uh, so about a big chunk of my adult life <clears throat> and it takes a long time to find them. And so, um, so that's why it's unlike some artist projects where you can say I'm going to paint, you know, ten paintings on this topic. I don't know what the I don't know where this project ends because uh, because it's it's shaped by uh, basically my research, I guess. You say they're hard to find, but it's shocking that there's a whole wall of them. So <laughs> these are actually postcards people would print and send, almost like attractions to yeah, other. Sure. Here, so here's two examples from, and also I just have a few to show you from the grouping that you just saw, but you can see the one here on the left, Hangman's Tree, Helena Montana, um, was literally sold as a colorized postcard um, from 1870. Wow. I've removed the two bodies that were hanging from the tree, and you see at the title, of, I've put their names, Arthur L. Compton and Joseph Wilson uh, at the bottom, and then on the uh, right, lynching of... Uh, Italian, uh, and Angelo Albano. Angelo Albano. <laughs> uh, two Italian men that were lynched in uh, Tampa, Florida in 1910. Yeah. Again, when we think about race and racial formation, uh, Italian Americans were eventually sort of recontextualized as white, but historically had been seen as sort of uh, ethnically other. And so it, in both images, I've removed the lynching victim to allow us to look at the structure of racialized violence or violence in general. And so we can see that the, the, the kinds of people that go to these events, uh, how they're dressed, how they are posed, um, their relationship to the landscape, their relationship to the tree, their relationship to the camera. As you can see, they're all looking in the camera in the Montana shot. And then of course, these were in some cases mass produced as postcards and uh, shipped and sent to friends and loved ones. In other cases, they became kind of tourist uh, elements. The, uh, so, the, yeah, go ahead. So these were definitely artifacts, like cultural artifacts that were produced using, you know, mass production media. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure how many survived. So that's a testament to your difficult work of having to find them, use them as material, but. Um, we're gonna, so that's the conclusion of this little section. And okay, we're gonna have more time for question and answer. You can screen share at that time as well, Ken. Okay. Um, but 
I have one question for you before this next exercise, because we're going to look again at second Garot for a little period of time and respond, given what you've told us and more of the history of your overall project and see if the responses, if the image has changed in any way for people. Um, but my question is about the title. Um, why is it called second Garot? Uh, is yeah, so first Garot, <laughs> They already they hanged a bunch of people in first growth, and then when they started hanging people in second growth, they had to sort of rename it. So Groveland, if you, if you go to uh, Yosemite, basically Groveland and Sonora are the the towns on the highway uh, to get to Yosemite, and so they were mining towns, and so um, they named it after the the Garot is the hanging device. Uh, if you've done you know, and so this is the the the, the reference for it. Groveland renamed itself Groveland instead of First Groat. And Second Groat is, there's no town there really. So it's just this historical um, marker. marker. This Interesting, it's construction. So we'll jump into questions. And one of the first ones is, um, have you visited the Equal Justice Initiative lynching memorial yet in Montgomery, Alabama? And if so, what was your reaction as an artist, Ken? Uh, I have not been there. Um, I would like to see it. I've seen many, many pictures of it. And of course, I know a few of the uh, people connected to it. As you know, they don't, they don't include any Latinos in that history. And so from my perspective, it can't be a national museum if it doesn't represent all people in the nation. And Latinos are a part of this nation. Mm -hmm. We have about 18 to 20% nationwide. And so, um, so, I, I would still love to see it. I think it's important to have, um, my understanding is they are focusing on 800 counties that are around, that surround that facility and are really focused on the African-American experience, understandably. So, um, so I, I look forward to seeing it someday. Mm. Um, another question is, is easier to answer or it's simple. Is there a strap holding the tree together? Those straps are functioning to hold it together, right? Yeah, there's two straps. There's kind of two pieces uh, holding it together and keeping it upright. I think there's some kind of pole or structure in the middle that's upright and then it's kind of attached to it. Because it was a very large tree, and apparently I've seen photos of it, it, it seems to have fallen over sometime in the 50s, the 1950s. And, uh, and the question of whether it was moved across the street is more a, a, a debate of speculation. Um, basically, from the 1850s to the 1950s, right, this idea of the American West um, has shifted. There's also some that argue it's not the actual tree and all of that sort of stuff. So part of the, the challenge with any of this stuff is to, um, is to recognize the difference between the artist and the historian. The historian cannot <clears throat> claim that that's the tree unless they can prove it. Right, there is a lot of records okay. suggesting it is. The artist's job is to inter invite people to consider a history. So there is an object that, that is a real bit of a tree that may be the tree. And my project asks you to think about, uh, as a, it's called Searching for California Hang Trees. Did I find it? Did I not find it? Um, the, the, the art project is about the searching and not, not so much about the finding, right? Art mm -hmm. is a series of questions. From my perspective. Uh, another question is, would you consider housing these images or research in a place like the Smithsonian, which kind of built off of what you're saying as of the difference, which is substantial between the historian and the artist. Artists dealing often in symbols and the potency of symbols are setting up a symbology um, and a historian requ requiring you know, evidence and whatnot. But still, the question stands, what would you consider housing these uh, in a place like the Smithsonian? Do you think that's where they belong? Um, there are some in the Smithsonian collection. And oh, there I, you go. <laughs> I had an exhibition there last year. Um, so uh, there's a part of the Smithsonian is over 22 different institutions. One of them is called the National Portrait Gallery. And its mission was to represent portraits of important Americans. And unfortunately, uh, in the context of the 
history of the institution, they were not able to or, or did not um, require very many images of Latinos. So there are really almost none in the collection his, uh, historically. They are now working towards adding additional uh, images and commissioning things even, portraiture and paintings. But I uh, was invited to have an exhibition there where I included this work to speak to the absence, right? Not only of Latinos from the history of lynching, but from the history of America. In our National Museum, a museum dedicated to represent our nation, which does include Latinos, um, I wanted to um, present that erasure or absence to our national public. And at the time when our current White House is uh, describing Latinos as criminals and murderers and right, uh, I could read the quotes, and, but that they're, they're upsetting, um, to hope that maybe he would walk through that museum and learn something or somebody would in that town and, and recognize that, that, uh, that America is diverse and rich and beautiful and that there's many of us here that, that contribute to its, its beauty. Is your collection of postcards of lynchings publicly available? It's mostly your website, right? Yeah, it's not. So the Smithsonian, you can find the Smithsonian ones on the Smithsonian website. Uh, they're in the National, uh, what is it, the American Art Museum. Mm -hmm. There also is a set at the, uh, in LACMA, which you can find online. And there's also a set on view right now at the Broad Museum in, Minis in uh, uh, at MSU, um, Minnesota State University. And that's on view right now. So those are, you can probably find those. So that's at least two sets. Great. Uh, as I mentioned, each set is 15, basically because the first set was 15 and so I've kept it the same. And so when there's 15 more, then I release it. And so, so far there's four sets. Uh, that each look at different, different, you know, slightly different histories. Well, um, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, but there's a good one to end on here. Um, are there specific represent representations of trees in the history of art that hold special resonance for you? That's, that's a great question. Yeah, uh -huh. I know you deal with art history in other series that you work in. Yeah, as well. That, so it's it is a concern of yours, and it's a, it's an interesting question. So. It is. So of course the there are so many, but um, part of the way the project started formally is that the trees are all shot with a eight by ten Deardorff camera, which is an old wooden camera uh, that I got on eBay, from, probably from the nineteen thirties. And the idea was that as uh, Edward Weston and Angela Adams, who did beautiful tree. Uh, and California landscape imagery, created this image of California as this, this virgin landscape waiting to be conquered and, and enjoyed, that the, the sublime was all there for, our, for the taking. And I wanted to try to say, no, those are, those are lands that, were, that people lived on. Those are lands that people uh, inhabited and before you got there, <laughs> you know, as a way of trying to speak to the larger history. So I wanted to use the tools, the master's tools to try to undo the sort of, if you will, the magic of photography, or the magic of landscape photography in particular. So I looked very closely at, at Angela Adams and Weston's trees and uh, many of the, the, you know, Harry Callahan, or, you know, so many um, amazing uh, tree images and uh, Fox Talbot and throughout the history of uh, photography. Yeah, it's, that's interesting, basically taking a format or a sort of lens of the West and focusing it on an unrepresented narrative. Tonight. And to see, if, and to see if, if I could change the meaning of that image. So if, if they are beautiful trees with the same camera, can it, does it function differently? Is there any way, and we, we could get into a larger discussion here about what is whiteness and how does whiteness function within an aesthetic model, but, uh, but we, really without any sleight of hand, is there any way that the, the artist, me, could change the meaning or the signification of those of those images and activate and acknowledge histories of those who are not here anymore. Yeah, that seems important. Um, I think especially now, I mean, it's always germane, but. So one last comment. Thank you, Ken, for sharing this, thinking about your work within today's current climate of violence against people of color and the 
etymology of the word lynching. Do you feel or do you believe that the word lynching has the possibility to change to include all forms of public violence? Um, do you have That's a response great. to that? That's a great question. Uh, that, oh my goodness, I have been on so many panels where people debate that question. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the history of lynching, if you look at any data set, whether it's the NAACP or the National, Muse National Museum, as they call it, uh, their data is all uh, using different criteria. So in the particular case where I, for the lynching in the West book that I wrote, I only used, uh, I didn't use, uh, if they shot a Mexican, I didn't count it. It was only if they used a rope and, and included some sort of a crowd because um, there's so many cases of them, of people of color being shot, <laughs> but wow. you would have a much, you know, it would be an impossible task. So there might be situations though, and there certainly are, um, where the killing is so intentional and so, um, so, so uh, spectacularized, right? Yeah, it's made into a spectacle. Right, that it's, that really, it is the equivalent of lynching, but generally speaking, it would have to have, uh, I, I, I normally stick to very, a very tight uh, definition, yeah. at least Latina's it's, logic. Just it's there's credibility. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about that history going back much, 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 much further to um, the idea of spectacleizing violence and how a body typically is raised up when that happens. And if you think about the history as well of crucifixions, which were done to hundreds of thousands of people in the ancient world, it was a way of like making a display of someone. And it, it's grisly and there's a deep history in, in human history of doing this. And um, that, diff like that intention of making this death into a spectacle and this like vigilante justice in the case of, quote, justice in the case of lynching, there's a real like grisly motive behind that, you know, of making the whole thing so public and installing fear in people. Um, so that there's a purpose to pull to this, purposeful edge to that, you know, that does make it really distinct. And, and it, this act of witnessing something that we've forgotten that we, you know, can do this is, it's a powerful element of your work, Ken. So, Thank you for doing your work. <laughs> I just thought I'd share the back of the postcard. Yeah. This, this is what we do with them, with these people down here. Yeah. So, um, thank you everyone for your excellent questions. Um, there are more of them and I wish we had time for all of them. <laughs> um, but we're going to turn it over to um, Vicki and Michael, who are at the site of the beginning of one of Ken's tours. So what Ken has done is set up tours um, through, the, through Los Angeles, well, it's, it's one tour, of the sites of violence that have happened in Los Angeles in particular. Um, and it's sort of surprising to see our own city through that lens for those of us who live here. Um, so Vicki and Michael, are you there? Hi. Yes. Hi. Hey. Yes. So um, Michael and myself, we're the field correspondents. <laughs> and uh, we're, uh, we're here to highlight actually um, part of Ken's research too is this he has compiled this, um, he's organized this Google map and a walking tour, a self-guided walking tour that you can um, do during this quarantine time by yourself, wearing a mask. Um, and there are sites in downtown Los Angeles um, that Ken has documented, um, sites of lynching and of um, including the Chinese massacre of um, 1870, one or so <laughs> and um so yeah so michael and i are here and uh we're here we're on one end you can see uh we're at uh, union station which is where the tour starts and then behind me right now is uh pico house which is another stop on ken's tour 
So that's the site of the Chinese massacre, correct? It's just about um, down that down alley. Down this alley near the fire station. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd just like to add too, um, Kenneth, I love the language you use of uh, the history behind the history you think you know. Um, or maybe another way to say that is like the history behind the performance of history. And here in the plaza, you can really. Um, see both of those things happening and I know I wouldn't be able to see it without having spent time looking at your images. You have beautiful trees and agapanthus and uh, fortnite lilies. You have a topiary of a, of a teddy bear. <laughs> a, the plaza and even you can even see like the um, old railway, the streetcar lines here and and so I'm looking at all this and just thinking of the image of Ken's map where that's where the some of the most lynchings occurred like around this area right here and it's just really powerful uh and very i think a gift of ken's work to help us think about the absence um of history as a felt presence the absence pressing in and and challenging us to recover those histories and to really like let those histories metabolize um in our own lives in order to be better people now in the present. All right, so we sincerely hope that some of you at least uh, take this tour and the link has been provided in the chat section. So go ahead and um, download or take a look at that map at the very least because many of us drive past or walk past these areas without an idea of what has gone on there. Um, so it's a, it's a striking and heartbreaking narrative, and it's important for us to know these things about our environments as well. Um, and Ken, we thank you so much for speaking to us from Joshua Tree and letting us bother you in your sanctuary there. Um, and we thank you for your work, and we thank everyone who's been a part of this conversation. And once again, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening.